Hello and welcome back to Grafted Branch Ministry. As always, I'm Scott Yerb, and today we're continuing our verse-by-verse -verse study in 2 Thessalonians. Now, last time we finished up chapter 2, and at the very end, he uses the word comfort your hearts, comfort yourselves. And I referenced it back to the same instance when he said, wherewith comfort yourselves together in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Speaking of our blessed hope, okay, the whole purpose of our salvation is that we're not appointed unto God's wrath. We're taken out of this world so that God then pours his wrath out onto this world. Our blessed hope is that we are not going to be judged for our sins. Instead, we have God's imputed righteousness. I also recently did a video that I'm going to do a part two of in uh, expectations of salvation. And that kind of ties into the same topic. And at the very beginning of, of chapter three in verse one, he says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. So, 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 so huge. To pray for the word of God, that it may have free course, and the word of God would be glorified. There's a lot of different uh, branches of religious systems, um, different churches. Excuse me, getting the hiccups at the wrong time. Um, that they lift up their traditions above the word of God. And they put the word of God, the King James Bible aside for their own interpretations. Now, it's a very, very dangerous thing to go and say, oh, well, I interpret this as, or our church interprets it this way. Okay, as soon as somebody tells you, or you get caught up yourself in saying, well, I, th I think this section is saying this, you've already failed. The word of God has then not been glorified and you're glorifying your own thoughts on the matter. When the word of God, it says what it means and means what it says. And if you can't believe what it says, well, then you're not giving glory to the word of God. You're keeping it from having free course for the truth in the word of God to be spoken. Okay, so let's look at some examples of this. And first off, Oh, I got my notes all scattered here. I usually line them up better than this, but anyways, go with me to Mark, the book of Mark, chapter 7. And we're going to look later on towards the end of this study at Matthew chapter 15. And it's a parallel verse talking about the same thing where Jesus was invited to go and eat with some of the church elders, the, um, the Pharisees. And he didn't wash his hands. And they started to ridicule him, him and his apostles for eating the bread without washing their hands. And he starts saying, you know, um, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of, a mouth, out of the mouth. And from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And it's all a very good topic to talk about. But to stay on the point of giving the word of God free course, okay, Here's a prime example of Pharisees, okay, uh, church leaders, religious leaders, elders, uh, prohibiting the free course of the Word of God, rather giving their own interpretation of it, holding upholding their traditions higher than the Word of God itself. So Mark chapter 7, verse 13, making the Word of God of none effect through your traditions, which ye have delivered, and many such things do ye. So, that's an example of man putting the traditions of man above the Word of God, above the free course of the Word of God. Instead of adhering to what the Word of God says and instructs people, they put that aside and they look at, uh, their traditions are, oh, we've done it this way for so many years, kind of deal. 
and a lot of people go back to Catholic traditions, all right? You have every group of Protestants, for example. They protest the abuses of Catholicism in order to reform Catholicism. But they're still holding two traditions, not the Word of God, all right? And a lot of people would point at someone like me or another Bible believer, someone that holds to the Word of God. They don't claim to be, oh, I'm a Baptist, oh, I'm a Catholic, I'm a this or that, whatever it might be, okay, Mormon, Seventh-day Advent, you, you name it, it falls into this category. And when they run into someone like me that says, oh, I believe in the Word of God, I'm a King James Bible believer, okay, instead of I'm a this church, that church, they instantly think, oh, you're a Protestant. But I'm not a Protestant. I don't protest the abuses of Catholicism to reform Catholicism. I don't hold up traditions of going to church or any of that in the place of the Word of God. Such as, uh, I mean, I've said it time and time again on here, on this channel, is the words go to church or attend a local church or any other form of that ever in the Word of God? No, it is not. People would say, oh, well, Hebrews chapter 10 says, uh, forsake not the gathering of ourselves together. In context, he's talking to Jews about Jews and their their ways, meeting at the synagogues and everything. So you're pulling that out of context when you're inter interpreting it as the church today, as you, Christian, watching this video today. All right, so with that, okay, going back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, reading again, Finally, brethren, pray for us. Okay, and they were the preachers of the Word of God, the new dispensation. Okay, pray for us that the Word of God, or the Word of the Lord, may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. There's those that they receive the Word of God and then they go off and make a church. And then they get caught up in 501c3 and, oh, we got to obey these certain stipulations according to the state. Not, and putting the word of God aside, so on and so forth. Going off on a tangent here, but let's look at some examples, okay, in the Old Testament. Turn with me to the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 19, the biggest chapter in the entire King James Bible. And I, I once knew a man, um, haven't talked to him for years, but he would tell me that, he would often um, go to his daughters and say when they're having a hard time, take the Psalm 119 pill. And it, it was to soothe them, to calm them. And throughout, we're going to just look at a couple different examples, but there's many different examples through the book of Psalms, especially Psalms 119 that tell you to adhere to, to lift up, to walk in the ways of the Lord, to obey the word of the Lord. So Psalms chapter 19, and we'll look at verse 9, verse 105, and verse 130. So starting with verse 9, we read, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed thereunto according to thy word? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? You don't cleanse your own ways under your own precepts, under your own traditions, but by the guidance of the Lord. Let's look at verse 105. Verse 105 in Psalms 119. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus was said to be the light of the world. The word was made flesh. Jesus is the Lord and Savior. He is God in the flesh. Okay, and then let's look at verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. And a lot of people say, oh, well, 
the Word of God is archaic and we have to interpret it and have these new translations. No, no you don't. That's hogwash. And if, you, if you're part of that crowd and think that the Word of God is open to interpretation or that it needs to be interpreted into a way that uh, connects to the world today, what did Jesus tell us? If we are of the world, then the world will love its own. But because I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So if you're trying to be of the world to win over the world, you've already gone against the word of God. Lastly, here, on the topic of glorifying the word of God and praying for the word of God, look at Psalms chapter 18, verse 30. Psalms 18, verse 30, we read, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. Now, a buckler, if you're not familiar, is a small shield used with a sword. Okay, and the sword, it, the word of God is referenced to being like a sword. Um, it cuts into the dividing asunder. But when you use a buckler, you're protecting the hand of the sword so that you are not in danger of being hurt when attacking. So the word of the Lord often does attack in a sense that uh, people don't like to be told that they're wrong simply. But what's funny is if you turn to Ephesians chapter, chapter 6, okay, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, okay, talking about the armor of God, the armor of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall, ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So the shield of faith, how much glory you give unto the Lord of the word of God, um, how much you hold true to the word says what it means and means what it says. When you do that, you're able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked instead of being, oh, yeah, that's a good point. And then you slip up and fall into a sin. I'm guilty of it just as much as you are, Christian. It's a challenging thing to live in this world and not sin. Um, that's why you got to pray for the free course of the Word of God. And that the Word of God be glorified, not man's traditions, not your own interpretation. So anyways, going back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2 now. And that we may de be delivered from unreasonable, unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. So when you're dealing with the word of God and you're witnessing to the lost world, there's going to be a lot of people that are unreasonable. Even those that claim to be Christians, they're going to look at the word of God and you show them something in it and they're going to instantly think, well, my church says... Oh, my pastor has said this. I, I've ran into it time and time again where I'm talking to somebody and then I tell them, I believe that the King James Bible is foolproof. There is zero mistakes in it. And it is the perfect inherent word of God in the language of English. And then they'll say, oh, well, there's mistakes and this and that. And then they'll point to the parts in Acts where Paul um, fell and um, when the Lord showed him the vision and pulled him aside and his and it says in the first instance that his men seeing no man, seeing no other man, but hearing a voice. And then when he recounts the story towards the end of the book of Acts, he says as a man many years later misquotes it 
he he's trying to recollect the instance of when the Lord came to him and told him that he must go unto the, the Gentiles and deliver a new gospel. Um, when he's recounting the story, retelling it, he says it backwards. Now there's the thing that actually happened, the truth, okay? And then when man, it's another prime example of when man tries to remember and goes off of the word of God, away from the word of God, and goes off of memory, which is why I often say I'm going to turn to the word rather than trying to quote a verse, a scripture, and mess it up. But later in the book of Acts, when he's recounting it, he, t he says it backwards, and he says, uh, they, they um, saw a man but heard no voice. And they'll say, oh, see, there's a mistake in the word of God. It's not perfect. Now, all things that are in the word of God are not right, but they are true. If Paul, recanting the story, re-recollecting -re what had happened to him and just sp spoke it wrong, would it be a proper, true thing in the Word of God to write it just as he quoted it? Or to change it because, oh, back here, it, it was said this way. No, you tell it just as the events unfold. And yes, when Paul was... Uh, fell to his feet and he saw the Lord they saw no man and but they heard a voice and then later and I could have it backwards <laughs> forgive me um, I did I, this just came out out of the blue but um, and then later on when he tries to remember what had happened he says it backwards so you know what let's go ahead and turn there I'm just was saying instead of misquoting Let's turn to the scriptures. Okay, so Acts chapter chapter 9. Yes. Acts chapter 9. Uh, verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling as, um, and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Okay, so they heard a voice, but seeing no man. And then later in the book of Acts, I am definitely not going to remember the section where this is. Oh, Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, I'm trying to find the particular verse. You can see in verse 14, he starts recanting it. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said unto them, uh, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Okay, and he goes on. Uh, there's somewhere here that he recants what the men had heard and done. But you got to remember, he was stricken blind at the time. And so he wouldn't necessarily know what the men had experienced. So, anyways. Yeah, it's kind of frustrating me that I can't find this right now. 
I know it's right here and I'm probably just not wanting to look or read far enough into it. So anyways, he does retell of what the men had experienced. Okay. If you remember the section, feel free to message me and be like, hey, you messed up here. <laughs> I mean, I'm just a man with a book. I'm not perfect. Just as Paul wasn't perfect and he misquoted what had actually happened. The point being is that no, there wasn't an error in the Word of God. There was an error in man when he was retelling what the Lord had done. Okay, so here again, reading 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2, And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Especially towards the end times, which is what I'm going to kind of reference here. And we are definitely living in the end times. So look at uh, 2 Timothy. Look at 2 Timothy. Chapter. Let's look at chapter 4. Okay. So if the men of this world. Okay. If they have their own way. Okay. The unreasonable men. And if they're not delivered from them and the unreasonable men have their way, what happens? It's, what hap it's what's happening right now. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They, they can't even endure it. They lash out whenever you bring them sound doctrine. They, they can't tolerate it anymore. So what do they do? But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They lift up teachers for themselves, the, telling them what they want to hear. They have itching ears and they just want to be scratched. Verse 4, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables, because they don't want to endure the sound doctrine. Okay? The unreasonable men. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. If you don't shun, if you're not delivered from those unreasonable men, and you don't shun the unreasonable arguments, okay, you put them aside, the profane and vain babblings, if you don't do that, then they are going to have the victory. And the word of God will be quenched out. Okay. Look at 1 Timothy as well. You have similar verses. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 through 5. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. They, their conscience isn't even there. Their conscience is seared away, and they heap to themselves those teachers having itching ears. They're, they're adhering to doctrines of devils, okay? And they for, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. What's the world's way? Oh, you don't need to get married until in your 30s. You, um, and then those that do end up going and getting married, they usually fornicated before the marriage and had a child. And I've also, so I don't know if, you, if you're new to this channel, one of my older videos I talked about it where I was engaged to a, a woman and going through, uh, you know, we we're happily ready and everything and the church that she was attending, uh, how be it a Christian church, obviously, um, the pastor there said that they, they wouldn't marry us unless if we went through his marriage counseling. Okay, so they're forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. It's a big thing right now to be a vegan or um, a vegetarian. And it, especially the Catholics, they, they don't eat meat on Fridays as part of their deal. So they're commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. It is sanctified by the 
Word of God. If you're ignoring certain sections of Scripture, you'll follow along with some of these doctrines of devils, wanting to have your ears scratched because you want to hear something good and that's pleasing. Um, I also was going to reference uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Yeah, we might as well do it. Verse 16, it's only one verse. Well, really verse 8 through 16. So verse 8, we'll read a little bit to get the context. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. It, wanting the, having the lust of the world, wanting this and that and money, and oh, I need to have this brand new car, I need to have... A, a trailer to go and do what I want to do. I need to have a beautiful house. Otherwise, I won't be seen as whatever. Okay. Verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some covet after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, verse 11, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, Faith, love, patience, meekness, fight the good fight of faith, and, hold, and lay hold on eternal life. So skip down. Look at verse 14. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his time he shall show who is the blessed and who and only... Nah, <laughs> which in his time shall show who is the blessed and only potent, the King of kings and Lord of lords, speaking of Jesus Christ, who only has immortality dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So, speaking of Jesus Christ, it's only by His righteousness, not your own. You can never earn your own self-righteousness, because your own self-righteousness always leads into greed or pride. <clears throat> Alright, so moving along, back to 2 Thessalonians. Chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 2 says, And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. But, verse 3, The Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Now, here, I want to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Just one quick verse. The Lord may establish you and keep you from evil. Now, when you hold faith and you stand strong in the Lord, this rings true. But if your faith is unwavering, and a lot of your faith is built upon, oh, I do this and don't do that kind of deal, you'll struggle with this. But 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will, with the temptation, also make a way of escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So, no matter how righteous an individual is, how godly an individual is, how um, much they seek after and follow the word of God, they are still tempted the same as everybody else. But they understand that through prayer and supplication, seeking out the word of God, letting it guide them as a light through darkness, Okay? Rather than thinking on their own selves or putting aside the Word of God for their own interpretation on matters, they follow the Word of God as if it's a balancing beam, which it pretty much is a balancing act. And as soon as you look off right, you'll fall right. If you look off left, you'll fall left. But if you're staying on the straight and narrow path, you'll stay well balanced. And He's not going to send you into tempta any temptation that you're not able to bear. And as long as you're adhering to the Word of God, you'll come over that temptation and, and continue on without being tempted. 
So back to 2 Thessalonians. Verse 4 now in chapter 3. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we commend you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Now we commend you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the traditions which he received of us. Withdraw yourself from those that walk disorderly. Withdraw yourself from the, the unreasonable men. Withdraw yourself from those that don't want to hold true to the word of God. They'll be a stumbling block for you. He says the same thing at the end of uh, chapter 5 in 1 Thessalonians. Again, Romans chapter 16. And pretty much every writing of Paul includes this in some way, shape, or form, that you withdraw yourself from those that <clears throat> don't hold true to the Word of God. They don't hold true to what Paul teaches. Now, what's really peculiar, okay, look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. So, some people say, oh, well, the whole word of God is for us. Yes, it's for correction and righteousness and reproof. But what's the dispensation which we're in? And then some people say, oh, there's no such thing as dispensations. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2 states, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, if you have heard of the dispensation of grace, which... Okay, if you read uh, Romans chapter 3, okay, we are saved according to his grace. He came down in the flesh and became the propitiation for the sins of us, which is given me to you word. So the grace of God didn't come until Paul was given that message. Okay, through Jesus' ministry, if all you read is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John... Oftentimes, Jesus, because he hasn't died yet, he says, keep true to the law. Do the things of the law. Which now, we're told, Romans chapter 10, verse 4, Christ is the end of the law to, to all that believe. How is that true? If the whole word of God is altogether for itself, just one giant message, one gospel, and there are no dispensations, then the Word of God has just contradicted itself. But if you understand that there is different dispensations, different divisions, okay, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Study, show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth, okay, then you're good. Went off on a little tangent there. Let's continue reading. This next section is where I'm going to reference... Matthew chapter 15. And we're going to read from verse 7 down to 15 here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Let's go ahead and get to it. Ooh, excuse me. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behaved ourselves, or we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail, night and day, and we might not be chargeable to any of you. Think of every church, okay? Every church that you've gone to, there's going to be a strong group of people there that think that you have to pay a tithe. And what is that tithe going to? That tithe is going to the pastor and those that work in the ministry to pay their wage. What is Paul saying here? For yourselves know how we, how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved ourselves not disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we 
might not be chargeable to any of you. Okay. Now, yes, there are sections of scripture that say that it's if the word of the of the Lord is your labor, you can make a wage out of it. But a lot of these churches, they have deceivers. They have children of the devil up there behind the pulpit that don't think that this is the pure and true word of God. They hold it up and they say, oh, I believe this interpretation. But they don't ever say, this is the perfect word of God. I believe that the King James Bible is the perfect word of God. Okay? I've stated that time and time again. Continuing on here. Okay? Verse 9. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commended you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now, busybody is someone that gossips. They're people that are going around and they're saying, Oh, have you heard of so-and-so? They're, I, I hear that they're messing around with this and they're dabbling in that. Well, you know, the word of God says this. They're being busy buddies rather than focusing on themselves, not walking disorderly, working their life, focusing on their own life before God, because no man is perfect. No, not one. All are without, or all are with sin. Okay. All men have sinned. Romans chapter three. Again, I reference that but there's those that are busy buddies they're gossips verse 12 now then now them that are such we command and exhort by our lord jesus christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread now he's not so there's a different here are some men that are being busy buddies and they're not true believers they're just looking at the things, looking at it as the law that they are to do and not to do. They're looking at their own self-righteousness, in other words. Okay. Verse 13. But ye, um, oh, verse 12. Now then that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Verse 13. But ye, brethren, be not wary in well-doing. Don't be worried in doing well. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Admonish him as a brother. Now, I was saying, let's go to Matthew. So let's go ahead and go there. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, it's a parallel verse to Mark chapter 7 that we already read earlier. But Matthew chapter 15, verse 7 through 9, Jesus says, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah the prophecy of you, saying, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But vain, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. And this is exactly what I've been saying this whole study. As soon as you put the commandments of man, or the, way, the interpretation of the word of God by man, rather than adhering to what the word of God says, the word of God says what it means and means what it says. Do you believe it or do you think that, oh, well, I interpret it this way and they interpret it that way. We'll just let bygones be bygones. No, no, no. That's what causes all these different denominations of Christianity. All right. And that's where man's thought thinks, oh, well, which church, which religion is the right one? I'll tell you right now, none of them. Okay. Because all of them stray from the book. They stray from the final authority and they make themselves to be the final authority. Or they uplift a man in the past or a man now as the final authority. Oh, we need to go and ask him what his interpretation of this is. And they're lifting up man as the final authority rather than it's finished. 
Okay? The word of God is finished. It's complete. So staying with this section of scripture, look at verse 12 through 14. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? So the, the disciples are coming to Jesus. Don't you know that you just offended the Pharisees? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. Every person, in other words, that is not truly to God, okay, just as we read in Second Thessalonians, um, they are busy buddies, right? Uh, now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that they should eat their own bread and work in quietness, okay? Be not wary in well-doing, and if any man obey not this word of this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Yes, he's a fellow brother, but and he's not an enemy. But is he of God? No. They are more wary in well-doing. Verse 14. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind, uh, back in Matthew chapter 15, sorry, verse 14, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into the ditch. Okay. And I'll bring up uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 11, um, where it says, if you believe in another Jesus and another gospel, uh, you might well bear with him. Um, so if you're following after a man's interpretation, a man's teaching. Yeah, chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Okay. Anyways, let's wrap up 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16 through 18. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means the Lord be with you all the salutation of Paul with mine own hand which is the token in every epistle so I write the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all amen and that grace is that you believe and accept and you have his imputed righteousness I've covered that already but Paul's writing this with his own hand at the end, as I've covered with First Thessalonians and with Romans. Oftentimes, Paul had another person writing out his words for him, and then he would sign off on it, saying that it is actually his words. But here we got First uh, Thessalonians chapter three, verse sixteen. Now the Lord of peace Himself give ye peace always. By all means, the Lord be with you. Look at 2 Timothy, one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So you've got to remember, okay, how powerful God is. And that the Holy Spirit of God, God's Spirit itself, is sealed within you until the day of redemption. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Let's go ahead and go there. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. As I said again, I, I'm repeating myself, it's not based on what you do. And if there's a busybody going around gossiping, oh, have you seen this person? Yeah, mark that person and have nothing to do with them. All men are sinners. All men are screw-ups. I screw up all the time. I'm sure you do as well. And if you think that you're perfect, I'm going to get into this in my the second part of my expectations of salvation. But if you think that you're perfect and without sin, put your whole life on camera and your thoughts and everything. 
I guarantee you that you will be ashamed because you're relying on your own self-righteousness rather than the righteousness of God. Okay, It's not of yourself. It's not of works. At least any man would boast. If it were of works, then everybody would be boasting upon themselves rather than the Lord. Anyways, that's that then. Um, as Paul closed out, uh, may the grace of God be with you. May peace be unto you. Thank you for watching, and until next time, take care. Bye now.